Not sure where to be, but I think this is uh, for the for the moment. I think this is what we need to do. Can you grab a table? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, brother. Appreciate it. Um, we're not done, but we'll uh, we'll just see what the Lord continues to do. But this morning, I do want to uh, lead us in a, a brief time of study together. If you'll open your Bibles, please to Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20, Um, grateful to the Lord for what he's done and uh, just even visiting us as he did today. I want to... uh, Preach kind of, a, it's, a hard, it's, it's a hard sermon for me. I don't know if it will be for you to hear, but it's hard for me. Um, I'm going to read from Paul's last words to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. I know that's not a place that many of us go for our devotional thought, but for the past several weeks, it's been mine. And um, I have gone through this with a fine tooth comb if you would I don't know how to chop it up and I don't want to chop it up but I'm going to try to break it in larger pieces because it's 20 verses and we usually don't use that much uh, text as we study together but but uh, but we've we've all heard the term closure before Um, we use it in different settings, different contexts, different reasons for it. Sometimes it's we're moving from a community with close friends and moving to a new place, new city, new state. Um, may, it may take place, what I did for some of our graduates last week and the last couple of weeks as they said goodbye to high school and maybe a number of their friends in that goodbye. Um, sometimes we say goodbye to a member of our family when we bury them. So all of these things, these are, this, is, this is closure. So we, we need closure when we finish a job because of a promotion or a termination or retirement. Uh, counselors understand the power of closure. You need closure, letting go, uh, to resolve grief. It depends on it. Or maybe you've used or heard another word. Henry Cloud wrote a book entitled Necessary Endings. And in in that book, we read about the importance of ending well, of saying goodbye, of releasing the present or the past to move on into an unknown future, and then of just knowing when to let go. We all have those moments. Um, there are often hard endings, but, you know, they're necessary. They need to come. It's important to get them done at the right time. And that's a time that comes to us all. The Bible says there's a time for everything, every season under heaven. When Nick Ripken came last weekend and showed up uh, unexpectedly to me, I received a visit from my oldest and closest friend on earth. Never had anyone uh, other than my own wife closer than Ken has been, Nick has been to me. I dropped him at his hotel on Tuesday night and we had packed a couple of days in tightly with a lot of visits and conversations and he shoots straight with me on a lot of stuff. A few hours later, after I dropped him off, he was going to be flying home. But we, we stood under the canopy of the Hampton Inn and wept. And, and I realized then it's a necessary ending. We both realized, we look at each other and go, you know, this may be the last time. And it's just part of life. 
just part of life. So when we're reading Acts 20, it, it's a summation of sorts of Paul's ministry in Asia Minor. His last visit in Asia before heading to Rome, where he would be martyred, took place near Ephesus. And it was to Ephesus that Paul had sent to the elders and said, come and meet me in Miletus. So he had asked the Christian leaders, pastors, bishops, overseers, elders of the church in Ephesus to gather up, to come to him 30 miles away to Miletus to meet with him. This is the only sermon we have in the book of Acts directed to Christians. Every other sermon is directed to the unreached or a Jewish community or something like that. So he met them, he admonished them, he taught them, he reminded them, he shepherded them through their closure. And he blessed them. Let me read a bit of it. Verse 17 begins, Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, he called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility, with all tears, with trials that happened to me through the plot of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. His words bore witness among them. And these words have been pressing me to think back over my years with you as a pastor. I've always known that a necessary ending was going to come. Every pastor is an interim pastor. When you're a new pastor, uh, when Heath Woolman comes on his first day, he will begin his first day as an interim pastor. We don't know how long his tenure will last. He doesn't know. We're all interim pastors. And I had to learn a long time ago, this church is not my church. It has never been my church. Let me clearly say this. I did not purchase this church with my own blood. This church belongs to Jesus Christ, not to me. And please do not ever make the mistake of saying, well, this is Pastor Tim's church. No, it's not. This is a church that was bought and paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ. And he is the only one who owns it and who deserves his name pasted over it. Paul continued in verse 22, Now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not count my life of any value, uh, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Now, before I launch into two or three quick thoughts here, I'm not comparing myself to the Apostle Paul. I'm not the Apostle Paul. Uh, I, I am humbled by his ministry, frankly. I understand it a little bit more after 43 years of doing this, but I'm not saying that, hey, Whatever that says about Paul, that's saying, but no, I'm not doing that, okay? Please hear that. But let me say, first of all, Paul did three things every minister needs to do, every pastor needs to do. I pray your new pastor will do this as well. And, and first of all, Paul ministered with transparency, with transparency. There is much of my ministry these past 30 and a half years that has taken place in front of you. You've watched me. You've heard me. And therefore, you judge me. 
you assess and you evaluate what you saw and what you heard. You weigh it. But like Paul and like every other spiritual leader that I've ever known, there are things that you never see. There are things that are experienced that you will never know. There are things that happened to me I never told my wife. Would not tell her. Could not tell her. And only God gets to judge those. There are things about me you don't get to judge. There are some very clear things you do. And you have a right to do that. Uh, Paul ministered with transparency. You see my life. Life in a fishbowl. That's the way a pastor lived. You know, you know, you get to watch. You watch where I shopped in a grocery store. You watch how I drive on the road. I still don't have a bumper. I don't, I don't still don't have a fruit coat bumper sticker on my car because my car is not saved yet, and I'm just not going <laughs> to put that on there. But. But he ministered with transparency. Can't hide it. You don't get to hide it. I don't get to hide from you. I never wanted to hide from you. God gets to judge, ultimately. But you can judge what you see. Secondly, Paul ministered with humility. You know, he worked as a tent maker for income. There was no church that was going to pay him. One of the most important qualities of a shepherd of God's sheep is humility. And a whole lot of guys miss that. I see that all the time now. The Bible says God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Paul calls himself a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm not my own boss. I don't call my own shots. I don't do what I want to do. I am a bond servant. Whatever the boss says, whatever the Lord Jesus Christ says, I go do that. Paul never said, remember my sermons. He said, remember how I lived among you. The text continues in verse 29. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among the, your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease day or night to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down, he prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all. And they embraced Paul and they kissed him. Being sorrowful, most of all, because of the word that he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. Paul ministered with transparency, with humility, and with integrity. I said, you evaluate. I didn't covet any man's silver or gold or clothing. Now, with integrity, I have to confess to you, I stole Robert Blood's sunglasses. <laughs> I didn't know at the time that I was stealing them. I found them in the back and was back one day. Nobody was around. We just had a college group here. And I thought, I'm oh, one of the kids left their sunglasses. So I stuck them in my pocket. And then one day I needed some sunglasses. And I had them in my car. And I thought, well, those are nice. So I'm wearing them all over the campus. <laughs> and in the meantime, Bobby's going, how am I going to tell the pastor? Pastor, I think you stole my sunglasses. He <laughs> hadn't found them. And he was, you know, it was kind of an awkward moment. And I... I uh, was actually on uh, the Saturday before Easter, I was on the parking lot with my, I'd gone to pick up Mikhail. I walked into the, into the gymnasium and, and uh, they were setting up for Easter Sunday and, and Bobby was in there working at the soundboard. I walked past with my sunglasses. He said, hey, nice sunglasses, Pastor. I said, hmm. I walked in, walked out. My kids caught me later and said, Bobby, 
where'd you get those sunglasses? And I said, uh, I just found them in the church. You know, I just thought they were just somebody's throwaway things. And they said, Dad, those are really nice sunglasses. <laughs> and they belong to Bobby Blood. <laughs> so I went, oh, man, Robert, I didn't know. Why didn't you tell me I stole your sunglasses? And he said, how do you tell your pastor you stole your sunglasses? You know, so, you know, it's just one of those kind of awkward things, but. Well, let me tell you what a good brother he is. He just said, well, he went ahead and bought himself another pair and said, I'm just going to give those to you as a gift. So that he, and then to rub it in a little bit, a couple of days later, he walks up and he brings me this really nice case. He said, hey, there's a case that goes with it. <laughs> so, so I now have a very nice pair of sunglasses that, uh, anyway. But. You know, a minister has three kinds of authority. Moral authority, spiritual authority, and institutional authority. Spiritual authority is, um, is something Jesus gives a minister. You didn't give it to him. You can't take it away. God gives that authority. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus said. If you have authority, it's because he gave it to you. So there's that. Institutional authority is, is basically given by the church. Um, in the vote last week, you, you voted to call Heath Woolman to receive the institutional authority of Fruit Cove Baptist Church. That means he's the guy that gets the keys now. He is legally in charge of the church. But you didn't give him spiritual authority, and you can't give him that. And then there's a third kind of authority, and that's moral authority. Moral authority is, well, we call it in other places, integrity. You say... You are a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that means there's a certain way that you follow with your life. If you are not following in that way, then either your profession is wrong or your actions are off. But either way, when there's conflict between what you say and what you do, you lose moral authority. Ministers give that away all the time. Only Jesus can take their spiritual authority. You can take their institutional authority as a church. But only the pastor himself could give away his moral authority. And Paul said... I've lived with integrity among you. I've lived with integrity among you. He said, I've maintained my moral authority with you as much as possible. And I would like to think I have done the same. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not looking back in any way with regret for things I left unsaid or undone or opportunities I've missed or pain I've caused anyone because of my decisions or actions or words. I can't unlive or unsay anything in my life, nor can you, but we can all hope to live in such a way that we don't reach our time of closure with regret. I don't want to look back and go, man, I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd taken care of that. I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't said this to that person. We want to live in such a way that when necessary endings come, we can end well. Jesus had the same task set before him. He had to say goodbye to his disciples, the only 12 people he really cared to say goodbye to, his friends and 
They gather at a table. He chose to do it over a meal, and that's why I would like to do as my last act among you a meal. Uh, as your pastor, I would like to lead us one last time in the Lord's Supper and just that we take a moment together to remember Jesus who gave himself for us, who died for us, whose body and blood were given as a sacrifice for us. Jesus was carrying a weight that night, and the weight was over um, the sin that he knew he was going to have to carry for these men the next day and for us. There was a weight that crushed Jesus on the way to Golgotha. The physical weight was the wood of the cross. The spiritual weight was the burden of your sin and my sin. And as he bore that weight for us, and as he allowed it to crush him, we together remember today that sacrifice he made for us. He did that willingly. And I'm going to ask you to take a moment, just as we've done before, to remove the little cellophane piece on the top. And Scripture tells us that Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, isn't that an interesting description for a night? What night is it? This is the night I was betrayed. The night he was betrayed, the Bible says he took bread and he broke it. And then he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take it and eat it. And as you do, remember me. Likewise, we're told he took a cup. In this cup was a symbol of his blood that he was going to shed. Christianity has long been accused by its critics of being a bloody religion. I will take that criticism. It is a bloody religion because that's what it cost for our sin to be washed away. And if that's the criticism we have to wear, then we will wear that criticism and do it proudly. There is nothing that can wash away the stain and spot and guilt of our sin but the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. The hymn writer said, what can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood, but the blood of Jesus. As we drink this cup, we remember his sacrifice and his blood shed for us. And with that, we're told. The disciples went out. They went out. The moment we're going to go out. But let me go back to where we started. We're not done. I changed clothes for a few moments. I can change back real quick. And I don't want anybody to walk out of here who felt in their heart a stirring by the Spirit of God to say, you need to do this today. Donnie, I don't know where Donnie ended up going. 
uh, Donnie, uh, Donnie said, I said in the first service that I felt like God was speaking directly to me. This is the time for you to do this. And maybe you're feeling the same thing tonight. So right now, uh, one last opportunity. We're going to stand. We're going to sing. And this is still your chance to come. Maybe if you just want to come today to join the church, become part of our church family, we'd love to have you come down front here. If you would like to be baptized, we'd like for you to go into those side rooms. Just go ahead and leave now. People will be there to meet you as you go through and show you what to do next. But we have everything you need ready for baptism. So if you'd like to come and do that today, let's do that before you go. And uh, we'll stay a few moments to get that done. But you come and do that. Let's stand together. Father, have your way in us as we stand in this moment. I am so very grateful for this church. I love these people. I love this body. I will always love them. Not because they're mine, but because they're yours, Father. And I thank you for the way they have loved me and cared for me and my family through some of the hardest days of our lives. And they have been faithful to serve you in that. Thank you for that. And I pray right now, Father, that uh, you might grow this family. They're more, this world needs more people like Fruit Cove. And I pray that if there are those here that you're drawing, maybe they moved here to this community, not even sure why. They're here to become part of this church family. So you draw them now. Bring them to yourself. And for any person who's not trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, any person, may they come today to receive Jesus, to follow him obediently in baptism, we ask in Jesus' name.